Yeah. So essentially, you know, the, one of the things I always felt like was bad psychology is looking at labor as a, as a fraction of something and, or as a cost. And so realistically, I mean, you, you, you guys tell me, but I, I don't see anything productive in the world happening without labor. Hmm. And so until we're, we're totally inundated with artificial intelligence, um, it, it, it takes humans <laughs> to make things happen of value. Yeah. yeah. And, and so in the first book, I used a simplistic measure, which is a, a good way for people to think about it. And it, and, and part of this was driven by my disdain of this, this calculation that I, I think I make a point uh, somewhere in my, either I did in an article, I, uh, I don't think I said it in the first book, mm-hmm. but, uh, but it said, never, ever, ever represent your company as revenue per employee. I mean, I, I, just, I just hate that, that discussion because one, revenue is the most flawed number on your P&L. None of us have the same revenue quality of a dollar of revenue. Now, once you take revenue minus cost of goods, gross margin across all those businesses is a comparable number, Mm -hmm. but not labor. Everybody deploys labor at a different output rate. Mm -hmm. And I use this as a way to teach it is if I'm in a staffing business, I'm generally producing gross margin because I really don't have any cogs, you know, but I'm producing gross margin of about one and a half times what I'm paying that person. And what that means from it, it's, it's a measure of how much the, the marketplace respects the value of your labor. If you want to look at it in a harsh way of saying for every dollar that I'm spending on labor, the market's willing to give me 50 cents extra, which 10 cents of that 50 is for payroll taxes and minimum essential benefits and 40 cents is for me finding the person, getting them to show up, and replacing them if you don't like them. And that calculation is based on the gross margin or revenue? Gross, gross, gross margin. On the gross margin. Divided by gross wages of that person that, that you're, you're charging out. Mm. And so that is the low end of the, of the value scale. So I always use staffing as, a, as the low end. Mm-hmm. Generally... And this is a lot, I think the, the data point kind of is a little bit of what I call pricing bias, is if you do kind of the cost buildup equation, you're going to see a common data point of gross margin per labor dollar at the $2 level, because that's really kind of the cost recovery of a decent profit. And if, if you do what you say you're going to do, that's about where the number always comes out to. But if you're really good at billing for the value and, can, and having true, you know, IP value, uh, know-how, you know, those kind of things, then you can move upscale. So like our IT managed service clients, um, they're probably an overall labor efficiency county management and direct in, in that 220 range. Uh, to to uh, maybe two twenty to two fifty, but their direct labor. It one of the things we do in the so new for every hundred thousand dollars of salaries, they make two hundred twenty thousand back of right, gross margin, right? right? Pretty much it, exactly calculation. Now that yep. simplistic measure is that hundred thousand of salaries is a blend of everybody in the business. That was and my so, next question. So that's basically right. the full labor of the whole company, not just cost right. of sales. That right? Yeah, and, and right. And so, in the in kind of the advanced way of looking at it, we we go into a whole chapter of kind of splitting it between direct labor and management labor. And so, direct labor, it's still looking at that gross margin number, but because it's only direct labor, you get a much finer you know analysis of how you make money. So, in mm-hmm. the professional services world that I live in, mm-hmm. my direct labor efficiency ratio is going to be a two. Mm-hmm. In, in most of those businesses mm-hmm. and a landscaping business is going to be a four. Mm-hmm. And, and here's, here's the reason why those two things exist in a, in a professional services world, you're lightly managed. So I'm expected to be a professional and manage myself. Mm-hmm. And so I've got a much lower cost of, of management labor overseeing that, that professional labor. Mm-hmm. In a lower labor cost category that needs direction and guidance, I've got a much more expensive management structure to, to get that $4 of value. And what we see is it helps businesses as we go through these analyses and examples. We see businesses 
you know, it like we get a lot of data points in the managed service provider world where we see they should be a four direct LER and they should be a four management LER. And in that environment, we see a 250 direct labor efficiency company, but we see a seven on the management labor. What that's telling you is I've got very inefficient direct labor because I don't, I didn't hire enough managers to make them productive. And I'm, I'm trying to run them almost more like a professional services. And so we get them to say, hey, you're, you're not giving your people enough guidance and coordination. You're leaving it too randomly up to their choice. And that's not the most efficient output, you know, business model. So you got to, you got to invest in management labor. The more what about common support label. That, yeah. But what about support what, labor? Like, you know, for example, you know, accounting that's like man- yourself, like yeah, is that's, that, man- we, we that's management. Yourself. Okay. That's all part of so, management. Secretarial, so I started, I, all that jazz. I started all- off calling it admin labor Yes, and I got pushback of ma- managers you know, the, the management people got offended that I called them admin. So I said, okay, we'll just call the whole bucket management labor. So it is anybody who's not direct is management labor. Got it. Okay. And And so so what you're trying to figure out is, you know, uh, what is the return on the management labor, you know, just for that support, the managers, Mm -hmm. the support, uh, the administration to, to the total gross margin. No, so it's direct total. To, to the total gross margin. Direct is to gross margin. Yes. Management labor is to what we call contribution margin. So it's gross margin minus the direct labor. So we uh, move one more step down to hold management accountable to that number mm-hmm. in, in that process. Okay. And, and because ultimately as a manager, you got three variables, your responsibility in that. If you're not a direct labor person, your responsibility is to help increase revenue minimize cost of goods sold ways and make labor efficient. I can affect that contribution margin from any of those three elements. And so typically what we see managers tend to be overly focused on one to the detriment of the other two. Mm-hmm. And so we wanted a measure that says, listen, I don't care how you get there. You can run all kinds of plays you want, mm. but just make a dollar drip out to, to justify your existence is, is what you have to look at. And, and that's and the so contribution you, margin that you're looking yeah, at. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, mm-hmm. and we say that cost, you know, contribution margin to me is the most important number on the PL. Uh, hands down. Why? You know, that is that Why? production of a dollar of contribution margin because that's the pure horsepower of the business engine. So it's that revenue, is the output. It's the revenue less the direct labor. Or is it Revenue less well, cost of sale? Cogs. Yeah, cost of sale. Okay. Sales. Less cogs and then it's minus it's, direct labor. Then. Minus direct labor. But what if direct labor? Well, you, you, have to, you have to take out the if cogs. You have to take out the, cogs first. Okay. Yeah, so, so cogs is just for the, the product side of things. But if your your cogs well, but you can, is you can labor because it's a professional services firm, it's the same see, thing see, then. Just because I have services doesn't mean I don't have cost of sales or, or you can call it cost of goods or cost of sales. Yeah. You know, it's an mm-hmm. interchangeable term. I, I, there are things that I choose to pass through. So here, here's the thing that you got to look at today's businesses. Mm-hmm. We're, we, we have basically deconstructed business to say, focus on the one piece of a value chain that you really do well. Mm-hmm. So why is it that a general contractor is a general contractor? Why don't they do framing? Why don't they pour foundations? Well, no, they get a subcontractor to do it. Well, that subcontractor is a blend of two things, materials and labor. Mm-hmm. And, and, but there again, I am taking now that, that subcontractor is a business unto themselves and they have to be profitable to be sustainable. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm choosing to do as a sub, as a general contractor is take the value chain of building a building and saying, I really just want to be paid for the coordination of all of the things that happen and and you're paying me for the value of what i do and i mm-hmm. still make a profit off of my cost mm-hmm. and these other people are being paid for the value of what they do and they'll make some profit you know too mm-hmm. and we've all kind of shared that you know in the overall value chain mm-hmm. but it's not un, unheard of that i could create a company that knows how to pour concrete and build put framing and put roofs on and 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 do carpet installation and it's not that it can't be done, but the business community has said, 
Well, you can't be really good at all those things. And so good example, I, I use this one all the time is like, if you're a manufacturer, well, you're a manufacturer. We, I got news for you. You're also a sales organization. Mm. So the question is, can you be world-class at manufacturing and sales? Probably not. Well, maybe I'm good at selling stuff and I need to do contract manufacturing. So why is it that we have stuff made in China and Latin America in, 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 or just by somebody else, even inside your own country, mm -hmm. because they can make it faster, better, cheaper than I can. I conceptually designed the product that I needed, but maybe I, I don't like doing that. I may be really good at making stuff and I suck at selling it. Well, <laughs> why? That's yeah. why distributors exist in the world. Yeah, sure. Exactly. And every company like in that value chain needs to be think to be thinking about this the same way. Yeah. Like exactly. So here, here's a great framework that I use all the time in our consulting clients. And I learned this from one of my clients, a company called quickparts.com that I, I helped them get started. They had a great arc sold out in about yeah. 10 years and, um, and learned a lot from the CEO, Ron Hollis. And I got to be really good, good friends, but mm -hmm. Ron, you know, he, this company, they were the first ones to create an instant quote for a custom manufactured part. So if you were a product designer and had a CAD program to design the part, you would upload this output file from the CAD program and you get an instant binding quote for a, a prototype of this mouse mm -hmm. next day. Mm -hmm. You know, in, probably this was in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And so the thing was, Quick Parts didn't, didn't own any equipment. They didn't make anything. What they did was, is they had a pricing algorithm that said there's a thousand or more data points out of that STL file, but there were only 14 that mattered for pricing, which is a very important point. And so they tested this algorithm of pricing. They hired a supplier that, that tested the algorithm and said, we will make any part that you quote under this pricing algorithm for 60% of whatever you quoted for. And so that establishes kind of a benchmark that we use frequently of saying in the value chain of, of a product or service, 60% of it is the value of doing it. But there's 40% that has three components to it. The marketing of it, the sales and closing of it, and the oversight of it. And so what Quick Parts built a business around was not owning a single stitch of, of prototype equipment. They got 40% of everything they sold, but they had to deliver on, they had to market to the, to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And we, we kind of think of that 40%, 20% of it's the marketing value. 10% of it is getting to contract. 10% of it is the oversight and coordination with a customer to make sure that things flow smoothly and they get what they're looking for. You can add plus or minus 5% to each of those four components of marketing, sales, oversight, production. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's an incredible framework for the separation of an economic activity into, you could have four distinct businesses doing each of those elements. Mm -hmm. and, and many of the people doing business today are exactly that. They are one of those four components. Mm -hmm. And then that's their business. Mm -hmm. And so you have to stay true to say, am I getting the appropriate value? Am I being overcompensated for a temporary period of time? And the market eventually wakes up and realize I'm an unnecessary component at that price. 